Okay, so I have 2.30 on my clock. Um, I'm Betsy Hill, president of BrainWare Learning Company, and I want to welcome everybody to our webinar this afternoon. We're very excited about this. We spend a lot of time talking about cognitive skills, um, but we very often think of them in the classroom or in other kinds of um, business situations or life or whatever. We don't always think about them on the soccer field or the football field or the basketball court or the hockey rink or any of those situations. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Um, just a few housekeeping things as we get started. We're going to um, encourage you to type any questions you may have today into the chat window. Um, we will probably save questions and answers until the end, but don't wait until the end because you may forget something. Just type those questions in as we go along and we'll be happy to address them as we get towards the end. I uh, want to say just one again that the uh, presenters have kindly offered a copy of the slides today and you can click on that link that I pasted into the chat window. Um, it's on this slide but you can just actually correct, connect directly on the um, link in the chat window to uh, find them. Um, we are recording our session today, so um, there were quite a lot of people who registered who were not going to be available at this particular time. Um, everybody's got busy schedules, and so this will be available later for anybody who wants to review it or for you to share with colleagues and the like afterwards, and we certainly encourage that. Um, and finally, if you, uh, when you registered, you were asked if you wanted a certificate of participation which we're happy to provide. We will automatically generate those for anybody who is attending today. If you are watching the recording and wish to have a certificate of participation, we will provide that as well. And all you need to do is to email us. You can email me directly, bhill at mybrainware.com. And I will type that in the chat window again in just a moment. Um, but I think that's, uh, that's all of the introductory stuff we need to do. So what I want to do now is just um, introduce you to our presenters today that we're very excited to have with us. Um, the first presenter is Abhinav Prakash, who, and Abhinav, or Abs, as, Abs as he is known, is a performance enthusiast. He has a ton of international experience, cultural learning accumulated from travel to over 20 countries. Um, he's a co-founder of Box Out, which I'm sure he will tell us about, and is really committed to meaningful contributions in society, the overall development of individuals across all the communities that he participates in. He's worked with many of the top organizations in sports around the world, including the National Hockey League, the National Basketball Association, um, the um, MLS, okay, I'm gonna show my ignorance on that one, as well as the NBA in India. Canada basketball and more. So really a passionate advocate for um, sports enthusiasts, women in particular in sports and leadership, and um, also spends quite a bit of time coaching young people in sports. Um, our second presenter is Dave Jordan, who is one of my colleagues at Brainware Learning Company. He works a lot with our clinicians and learning specialists um, from a variety of different kinds of disciplines, helping them incorporate cognitive assessment and cognitive training into their practices. Um, in doing so, he applies his personal experience as a colleg collegiate athlete and also a semi-professional hockey player in his work and works with a lot of athletic trainers who incorporate cognitive skills development as part of their training and also post-concussion regimens. So I want to welcome um, Abhinav and Dave and say again how delighted we are to have you with us today. Thank you, Betsy. It's a pleasure to be here and welcome to all of uh, our friends and folks who are able to join. Dave, are we here? Yep. So just wanted to again uh, extend that, that thanks to everyone who's going to participate today in our webinar about the science of sport performance. Awesome. Uh, let's get the show on the road. So, uh, ladies and gents, the first things uh, that we're going to go over today and what you can expect, first of all, the stages of performance, foundational cognitive skills, understanding the role of cognitive skills in sports, multiple object tracking, 
And finally, critical skills and noteworthy examples that you might be familiar with. So first of all, let's talk about a lot of what we hear in the media. You may have heard LeBron James spends a million dollars a year optimizing his body. You may have seen things like Steph Curry training with strobe goggles and doing float tanks. Today's elite performers, whether they're athletes or in the military or at any level, they're using state-of-the-art science and technology to optimize how they can perform on and off the field of play. And the whole idea behind Box Out and Brainware coming together to put together this webinar is about showing all of us how everyday people, even if you're not elite, how everyday people can perform uh, to our best and to our full potential. First, let's talk about the stages of performance. I'm sure many of the people who are tuned in here today are athletes or coaches or teachers, and we're all performing on a day-to-day -day basis, but we may not necessarily think about it in this way, the stages of performance. Before a single move can be made, a process takes place, and this happens in fractions of a second, multiple times a second. First, we sense. Did you guys know that 70% of the sensory receptors in our body are actually in our eyes? And that's actually 130 million receptors in each eye, which is really the area of a postage stamp, that size. 130 million receptors in each eye. So we're always gathering information and 90% of this information is transmitted to our brain. Then we have to process all this information. And processing is a very important stage. This is where brainware is critical. Uh, most of us who are here on the webinar today are probably using smartphones, whether it's Apple or Samsung or Huawei or Google. Uh, whatever phone you're using typically has somewhere between eight and 60, 64 gigabytes of memory. Now, once your phone slows down, what do we do? We simply discard it and get another one. Now take this in, our brains process 2 billion messages of visual information per second. To break that down, that's basically 109 gigabytes of information being processed per second by our brain. Now when our brain slows down, or we're not able to process as quickly what we might be seeing on the volleyball court, or on the soccer field, or in the ice rink, when we're not able to process efficiently, we can't simply do an upgrade or swap our brain out with someone else. We actually have to now strengthen our brain and work on this process. After that, we have to decide. This is where intangible factors as well as cognitive abilities come in to help us decide on the right alternative and the right method for us to take. And finally, we can react. So in sports, where most people think, if I spend all my time training my strength and speed and agility and power and coordination, I'll be great. That's only the last stage of performance, and you're doing yourself a disservice if you're not working on how you sense, process, and decide. There's another way to look at this. It's called the performance loop. In sport, whatever sport you might play, or even in life, for example, driving. First, you're always sensing. That leads to perception, cognition, and execution. Now, Dave will talk us through some of the cognitive skills and what they support. Great, thanks Abhinav. So it's, it's really important to emphasize the cognitive skills that are the underlying mechanisms to support learning, problem solving, and performance. So again, when we talk about those cognitive skills, uh, it's really you know, critical as a concept um, to explain how the relationship of cognitive skills work. And cognitive skills, operate in conjunction to one another. So that's a, a really primary uh, element of cognitive training. So there are processes simultaneously going on in the brain and on the court or on the field. So imagine for a minute you're jogging down the field or running down the field. Uh, there's a strong emphasis on the visual system, right? So you're scanning the field, you're scanning the court, um, you're identifying boundaries. You're listening for your teammates' voices, communicating. And then you're alter alternating that into reasoning. Um, so again, judging distances, identifying boundaries and recognizing coverage. Um, and that all, that all plays into 
uh, the organization of recall and filtering distractions. And then while you're doing all of this, you're dribbling or stick handling. Uh, so there's a process where you don't really think about um, consciously that all these mechanisms are working together. So in Brainware, we develop over 41 individual skills, and we've broken those down into five main categories. Uh, so the first category is perception, so that's visual and auditory. Uh, the next is attention, uh, and then we're moving into memory, reasoning, and coordination. So the, that sensory aspect of um, you know, hand-eye coordination, moving proprioception, uh, things like that. So again, <laughs> I'm gonna emphasize that all these cognitive skills do not work in isolation. They all work in an integrated neural network and combinations. Uh, so very similar to a team, cognitive skills play off the strengths of one another. And for the first example, we've just got those visual skills that we talked about before. So visual processing, auditory processing, spatial processing. Um, and then we have coordination skills, hand-eye, response time, impulse control. The next example would be reasoning. So these are things like decision speed, planning, critical thinking, set shifting, strategy. Uh, and then we go into some of those attention skills and we'll just give you a couple quick examples. Selective attention, divided attention, flexible attention. So that's your ability to, to go back and forth and switch gears. Um, and then the last one is memory. So that's our ability to apply new, old knowledge to new situations. Now, we, we're all probably, uh, you know, familiar with Tom Brady, right? Uh, he's a very renowned quarterback, plays for the New England Patriots. Uh, but a lot of the things that Tom Brady did not have going into the combine uh, were some of the physical attributes. And Abhinav's got a great example of some of the obstacles that Tom Brady had to overcome that we may not know about. Yeah, I, I think our our – Folks and friends who are here in attendance today should all be pretty familiar with uh, Mr. Tom Brady. Um, in the 2000 draft, when he was preparing to enter the league and he was eligible, he was doing the scouting combine and the draft combine and different types of events to show off what he had. And all the analysts and experts and scouts that ever saw him basically said outright, this guy will never play a game in the NFL. Very poor mobility, very poor arm strength, not a good physical specimen, no speed. Uh, these are things that you would think are required to be successful in sport. And as a result of this analysis that most experts agreed on, Tom Brady actually fell to the 199th overall pick in that draft. 198 players taken ahead of him and many, many quarterbacks. The reason he was selected is because Bill Belichick, who at the time and still is the coach of the New England Patriots, is a big believer in some assessments that evaluated an individual and an athlete from their cognitive abilities as well as their mental traits. These are the same assessments that BoxUp uses today with the athletes and individuals that we work with. And what that identified was that Tom Brady was far and above superior to all of his peers when it came to things such as mental performance, mental toughness, coachability, decisiveness, attention to detail, and more factors that really he just stood head and shoulders apart from the competition. He was drafted in 2000, and if you look today, he's still relevant. If you called him the greatest quarterback of all time, not too many people would argue. And even if you called him the best football player, not too many people would argue. But it really goes to show how his cognitive and his mental abilities, everything that was above the neck, really allowed him to be the greatest. And when we think about all, so, all sorts of sports, whether it's Floyd Mayweather in boxing, or Steph Curry in basketball, or Sidney Crosby in hockey, or Messi in soccer, these guys are never the biggest or fastest or strongest. It's really their visual, their cognitive, and their decision-making abilities that elevate them to being great. Right. So let's take that example that we all know of a quarterback dropping back for a pass. So he's, first of all, he's, 
uh, locating various targets on the field with his visual span, um, visual spatial integration, knowing where those players are uh, in comparison to where he's throwing from. So deciphering through uh, those visual cues, you also have to remember the play. So that's selective attention. And then going through those progressions or, or the different options that they have to go through, that's visual span, flexible attention, working memory. And then imagine doing all of that on the run. So you have to coordinate your, your fine motor skills and again, working on that divided attention. It's funny how we ran out of space to list all the cognitive skills that he's using here. In, in just three tasks that he has to do, he's using over 15 different cognitive skills. So we've got a quick video of what that might look like from a quarterback's perspective. Hey, we got done. Flip right over. All right. 50 quick off the Hold on. Here we go. Hey, Mike 31. Mike 31. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Okay, so we'll go three wides. Three wides. We got three up in. Here we go. I want to get the parentheses up there. I want you to flip number six. So we're going to fly out. Do the right flop. 17 train. Hold on. Keith is, to me, very reminiscent of a Charles Ward type player. He, uh, he plays the game, but this is so dumb. He can distribute the football really, really well. Two or three. Right, so there's a pretty basic example of a quarterback having to uh, call the play, remember the play, and then if that play doesn't develop, he has to re remember that other option that he always has is running to the sideline and trying to gain as much yardage as possible. Uh, so taking another example of a lineman, right, their primary goal is to keep the play in front of them while protecting their quarterback. Uh, and obviously snap count plays a big role in every single play in football. Uh, because that's what starts the play. So you're using your inhibitory control uh, and also some of the timing mechanisms to not go off sides. Uh, and then take, for example, uh, a wide receiver. Right? So he has to be able to visualize that ball, track the ball, and then obviously catch the ball and make a full secure catch. Depending if you're on the sideline, you have to have the flexible attention to have two feet in bounds. And then Possibly, if you're not on the sideline, maybe you're in the middle of the field, you'll use that working memory to remember where that defender is coming from so you can juke or deke him and proceed up the field uh, to gain more yards. So some of the same skills that we talked about for a wide receiver also play a role for a safety. That's the other side of the coin. So some of those uh, key visual skills, visual span, uh, visual discrimination, um, Visualization, for example, if a defender gets by that safety, they have to be able to visualize in the back of their head where that route might have led that opponent. That way they can position their body uh, to either intercept the ball or interfere with the throw. And what's really interesting here is that although we're talking about all the different positions and they all have completely different tasks, in terms of the skills that are required for them to go and execute, they're very similar, aren't they, Dave? Right, yep. They all work together, and they all play off the strengths um, of those counterparts. Okay, cool. So taking it to uh, another familiar example of baseball, uh, obviously with the World Series just wrapping up, this might be something that's uh, at the top of our, our, uh, our priorities for those on the, on the East Coast. Um, so I'm going to get a little bit more of a, of a physiological process here. Uh, so the eye is not able to execute a smooth pursuit of an object traveling over 80 miles per hour within a 55 feet uh, space. So what we're doing is relying on the eye's um, saccades, is what they're called. And they're basically just snapshots because your eyes can't track that ball moving that fast. So what your eyes do, what your eyes do is take little snapshots intermittently uh, and then your brain has to essentially fill in those gaps for what your eye misses. So during that whole process of a pitch, 
you're detecting small variations in the pitch style, the delivery of the pitch, uh, and things like arm angle, release angle, shoulder angle, uh, torso rotation, leg kick, etc. cetera. Uh, so as I said before, the brain fills in the gaps that the eyes miss. And a really good example of, of taking this example, uh, excuse me, taking this situation um, from a professional baseball player standpoint, uh, I was talking with one of our clinicians at work uh, with a lot of athletes in preparation for the, the webinar today. And he was telling me a story about Daryl Strawberry, how Daryl Strawberry would swing as hard as he could at a spot over the plate where he thought the ball would cross. Uh, so even some of the best players in the world, they're just taking those educated guesses based off of all the recall and all those pitches that they've uh, acquired in their, in their visual memory uh, over all those different years. So it really can come down to those cognitive skills to pick up those, those various nuances. Yeah, most people don't realize that in baseball, if you have a 333 career average, if you're hitting one out of every three, that's almost like a Hall of Fame type of career right there. And the people who are the best at hitting are often the people who are also the best at estimating where that ball is going to be. Right. So now let's take a deeper look at the whole process of what a hitter goes through. Typically, uh, nowadays, pitchers are able to throw real heat, like over 100 miles an hour. But let's just say uh, you're standing 55 feet away from the pitcher, uh, from the release point. The pitch is coming at 100 miles an hour. So roughly that means it'll take about 375 milliseconds for that pitch to get to you. Now in that time, on average, it'll take a pro hitter about 100 milliseconds to identify the ball. How is the angle of it? What speed is it coming at? Where, um, what type of pitch is it? Knuckleball, curveball, fastball, looking for the rotation. And we're trying to identify in those 100 milliseconds, one-tenth of a second, what type of ball is it? Then the hitter also knows, because they practice their hitting every day, they know that it takes them roughly 150 milliseconds to complete their swing, the entire swinging motion to, to go from behind your neck to making contact with the ball, roughly 150 milliseconds once you're a pro hitter. So what that leaves is 150 milliseconds only for a decision. And what separates the greatest baseball players from very poor baseball players is discipline, the ability to determine is that a ball I should be swinging at or not. And that decision time is very, very little if you think about it. It's the blink of an eye to be able to decide, is this a ball that I lay off or is this one that I swing for? Now, let's think about multiple object tracking. In, in life and in sport, at any given time, we're tracking hundreds of things. First, let me give an example of like yourself in your car. Most of us here, who are here on this webinar today had to drive to work or had to drive somewhere. Now, when you're driving, you're not only paying attention to what you see around you, other cars, oncoming traffic, lights, signs, potholes, lane markers, etc. but you're also paying attention to tons of things inside the vehicle. Similarly, when you're an athlete and you're playing a sport, you're not, you're not thinking about it, but you're tracking hundreds of objects, things like the ball, scores, timeouts, teammates, boundaries, officials, formations, coaches, teammates, all sorts of things that you don't even think about when you're actually playing. But those who can do this well are the ones that really succeed. Let's show everybody an example here of what some of the world's best do. Want to know how the pros track? Try this. Four targets at superhuman speed. Did that seem impossible? It is without training. But we know NFL, NHL, NBA, and Premier League players who can track that easily. Now imagine, how could you perform if your brain works at that level? You already know this, but the truth is, being an elite athlete is about more than physical ability. Mental processing and situational awareness, those are the real secrets of elite performance. The best athletes process information faster and that's how they put themselves in position to make game-changing plays. 
you too can enhance your performance. You too can have superior mental focus and decision making under pressure. What are you waiting for? Start your path to improvement today with a personal 3D new train program. So as we saw there, multiple object really allows for people to be thinking ahead, making a right play and seeing opportunities that aren't even there. And oftentimes you might hear commentators and analysts say, wow, did you see that? This guy's eyes in the back of his head. How did he know he was there? What they're really referring to is this person's ability to track multiple objects. And that's an essential skill for passing. Right, absolutely. Um, so having that ability to see that play develop, uh, and uh, when you're passing, you want to lead that receiver so they're not turning back. Um, you want to pass it so they accept the pass in, in full stride. Um, so again, you're trying to determine where those open spots in the coverage are, uh, open spots on the ice, open spots in the court, um, things like that to put the ball, the puck, um, you know, where somebody can accept it and then continue to make a play. So there's all kinds of things like timing, visualization, visual immediate short term, um, reaction time, decision speed, all those things play a role in passing. And the same goes for catching, just the, again, the other side of that same coin. Uh, so some of the, many of the same skills for passing that you'll see in catching. Uh, so completing that catch, selective attention, sustained attention, divided attention if you have to make a move after you make a catch. Um, having that visual discrimination to track the trajectory of the ball to position your body in the right place. Um, and again, if you have on the sideline, flexible attention to make sure you get two feet down in bounds. Uh, so the same can go for defending. You want to position your body to impede or interfere with the ball or puck. Uh, so that's that visual spatial integration, knowing where you are at all times and distinguishing objects background from others. So that's visual figure ground. Um, movement predictions, again, you're, you're tracking the movements of your teammates and also the movements of your opponents. So talking a little bit more about some of those same, same features, same skills in goaltending or goalkeeping, you gotta orient your body to make sure you're blocking the ball, um, positioning your body to uh, be in that, the optimum place to prevent a, a rebound from coming out. So you're identifying all the objects on the field uh, throughout the entire time of the game or period. So you're having that sustained attention as well to track that ball or puck the entire time it's in play. And we're moving into, uh, I think Abhinav's got a great example of some cognitive skills uh, associated with combat or, or fighting. Absolutely. Uh, combat isn't the most tra traditional sport. This is quite different from a lot of the sports that are mainstream. Uh, there's no goals. There's no touchdowns. There's not much that's qualitative, quantitative about it. It's very subjective. And this is evident if you look at the scorecard after a fight. Every judge's scores will be different based on what they saw and based on what they perceived. And that's very interesting about combat. Uh, we've gained certain insights from working with some of the world's best boxers and fighters. Uh, one of the insights that we gained was something called the whiteout effect. Are you familiar with that, Dave? Uh, I've not heard about that. What, can you tell us a little bit? For sure. So the whiteout effect, let me, let me put it this way. Picture yourself at an arena right now, whether it's a boxing or baseball or whatever. When you're sitting in the stands or sitting at home watching the game from the TV, you don't necessarily see any distractions. You just see the game. When you're an athlete in the middle of the ring or on the ice or on the basketball court and you look around, you're going to see thousands of people. You're going to see camera flashes. You're going to see all sorts of lights from the top. You're going to see all sorts of distractions. And these are not present when the athletes are actually training to perform uh, at, at the big stage. So because their vision and their sensory abilities are really hindered with all these distractions, nowadays a lot of athletes use strobe training or different types of training that are available in order to help them train with less vision. It builds muscle memory and they can actually perform in the ring despite all those other distractions. Another key thing to note about combat sports, for example, is the fact that most people never even think about 
how you have to show the judges what you're doing. One of the key insights that we got when we were talking to a boxer uh, was the fact that more than anything, instead of knowing where the opponent is, they always also have to know where the judges are. Because what is the point of landing five consecutive uppercuts if your back is facing the judge? They're not going to be able to give you credit for that. So in addition to your task, which is knowing where your opponent's hands and feet are, understanding their tendencies uh, while rotating, predicting combinations, ability to predict where any strike may come from and positioning your body. In addition to all this, they have to present it to the judges and the panelists. So they have to constantly be aware and cognizant of how they present and demonstrate exactly what they're doing. And this takes yeah. several cognitive skills. I never, never put, I never thought of it that way. It's, it's, that's some great insight. Yep. And, and similarly, we can even look at shooting. Now, when it comes to shooting, you know, it's in the Olympics, it's in all sorts of world championships, whether it's pistol shooting or rifle shooting, sporting clays. But many people don't realize that archery and basketball aren't that different. What Steph Curry has to do and what an elite shooter has to do is not very different. You have to know where you are in relation to your target. You have to precisely shoot an object towards a target, recognize and adapting for different factors such as wind or hands in your face if you're Steph Curry or uh, you know different types of variables that you have to be able to count for, maintaining a balanced position and extreme focus. Now oftentimes, uh, as Steph Curry, let's just use him as an example, as he's preparing to shoot, because he's so lethal, teams will throw two, three guys at him. Another example you could use would be Cristiano Ronaldo, right? In soccer, if the ball gets on this guy's foot, defenses start to shiver because they get scared. They start throwing two, three defenders at him just to make him pass because they really don't want him to shoot. One thing that both Steph and Ronaldo have in common is that they have the ability to create time and space. They can shoot even when the factors aren't perfect. All our lives, mentors, parents, teachers have probably told us, don't waste time. If you waste time, you'll never get it back. And while that's completely true, what they didn't tell us is that you can create time. And this concept applies in sports as well as life in general. If you have a faster or stronger visual cognitive system, what I mean by that is if you can get through those initial stages of performance, how you sense, process, and decide, if you can get through those stages quicker, you can obviously react and have more time to react. Similarly, if your cognitive and visual system is weaker or slower, and it's not something that you're paying attention to, you will create less time to make your decision. Let's look at an example here to illustrate the point. One thing I want you to notice here is that on every play, the entire defense, all the players in the other team's jersey, they focus on Curry. So wherever he goes, he's double team, triple team. But because his visual cognitive system is functioning at such a high level, he can make a pass, relocate, get himself open, and find shots that otherwise he would never, no other player would be able to get given the type of coverage. So he's able to get completely wide open threes, even though the entire defense is collapsing on him because of how quickly he can process and decide and move around and pass the ball. He's creating time and space for himself. Now let's talk about some critical cognitive skills that you will recognize from your day to day. And there's so many, Dave mentioned there's 41 cognitive skills in general that can be trained, but these are the three that we're gonna highlight and they're all aspects of multiple object tracking. The first is selective attention, the next is cognitive flexibility, and finally, situational awareness. So selective attention can simply be defined as the ability to focus on a specific object or task for a period of time while ignoring or discarding all other 
information and stimuli that's constantly incoming. So I mentioned earlier, our brain is processing 109 gigabytes of information per second. So to put all of that aside, or most of it, and focus on that one task or one object for a sustained period of time. Let's look at an example here. For example, in basketball, when a player is taking a free throw, it's called a free throw because it's supposed to be really easy. However, look at these images here and you'll notice it's not quite that easy. You're, as, a, as a player standing at the free throw line, you see hundreds and thousands of fans that are waving, yelling, screaming, throwing insults, raising up signs, telling you to miss it, um, all sorts of distractions. And as a shooter, you have to completely block out all that noise and distraction and focus on your job, which is to put a ball inside a 22-inch rim. Similarly in baseball, a player's up to bat. We talked about this example earlier. You're focused on just the pitcher and the ball, but it's a skill to be able to disregard everything else that you're seeing, all the other players, the field, the jumbotron, the fans, and you have to block all that out and pay attention to that one tiny white ball that's coming towards you at 100 miles an hour. These are not easy tasks, and humans are a higher order species. We have the ability to apply selective attention, whereas other types of species and animals, take a horse for example, if they had the skill, we wouldn't have to put blinders on them, right? We, we can tell them specifically what to focus on, but we can't necessarily do that with humans without looking ridiculous. So we have a little engagement factor here, a little test to see how good you are at selective attention. So I'd like you to pay attention to the screen and follow the instructions that appear. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball. Sorry, not sure what happened there. I'm just going to play this again. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball. What is he fucking doing? The correct answer is 16 passes. Did you spot the gorilla? For people who haven't seen or heard about a video like this before, about half missed the gorilla. If you knew about the gorilla, you probably saw it. But did you notice the curtain changing color or the player on the black team leaving the game? Let's rewind and watch it again. Here comes the gorilla, and there goes a player, and the curtain is changing from red to gold. When you're looking for a gorilla, you often miss other unexpected events. And that's the monkey. So this is a great example here. It shows, you know, when you're trying to pay attention to one thing, um, you often end up missing lots of other things. So it's really important for us to be able to take in all the information, recognize differences in our environment and what's developing, and still to be able to focus on that task, which in this case was to recognize that there were 16 passes made, but also to understand that a gorilla came, a player left, the curtain color changed. It's quite a lot, right? Did you get it, Dave? I did not get all the passes. <laughs> I don't blame you. <laughs> all right. So moving on to the next skill, cognitive flexibility. This is the ability here uh, for one to switch your thinking or changing your train of thought as an adaptation to the demands or stimuli of the environment. I know Dave is going to talk to us a little more about this. Yeah, just a really simple principle is that you have to be able to 
kind of switch gears both physically and mentally, uh, especially in a lot of the fat, higher paced sports. Um, so while you're maintaining the same goals and the same objectives. So it's you, one way you could look at it is your ability to be versatile and also your adaptability. Uh, there's, a, there's a common saying in the, in the military and some of, some of the audience members may hear this before, uh, improvise, adapt, and overcome. Uh, so when your environment doesn't match up to your expectations, how uh, fluid you are in into switching up the way you would uh, handle a task. Uh, whether that's you know, on the ice or in life in general. Uh, so again, it's that ability to be versatile while changing into uh, a new uh, mindset. So again, um, for an example of her hockey and basketball and soccer, some of those quicker moving sports, you're always improvising those movement cues. You're not only watching your own teammates, but you're also countering your opponent's moves. Um, same thing goes for football. A lot of the, dif a lot of the different teams, um, they disguise their tendencies, they disguise their coverage, they disguise ske uh, schemes and formations to bait you in. And then when that, expect that expectation of a certain play doesn't happen, how well you're able to kind of flip the script and still maintain a focus for that, uh, that shared goal on the field. One interesting way that I think about this is kind of like, imagine your brain as a television set. If you can only focus on one thing at a time, and I'm sure that for the people who struggle with this, you've probably heard about it from other people. Oh, you can't focus on more than one thing at once. Like when you're, when you're thinking about one thing, think about it as a TV station, you're tuned into one channel. Now something happens. Are you able to quickly change channel and change your train of thought and pick up from right where you were? Or does it take you a lot of time to change channel and change your train of thought? So people who are high on cognitive flexibility can flip through channels like it's nothing. And they can change your train of thought no matter what, depending on what develops in front of them. What, similar to what Dave was saying, being able to read and react and flip the script when required, they can quickly change a channel to throw you off. But people who struggle with cognitive flexibility tend to be stuck on that one channel or that one way of thinking. Let's do a quick uh, experiment here. Sorry, did you want to add something, Dave? I was just say that's a great analogy. I like, I like it. Absolutely. So let's do a quick example here and see how all of you, our, our listeners, are at cognitive flexibility. So what I'd like for you to do here is take out a stopwatch. Could be your cell phone, could be just a watch on your wrist. Just get a timer ready and in about... 10 seconds, I'm gonna give it you a task. The task is gonna be simply read out, out loud, the words that you see on the screen. Not more complicated than that. So I hope you have your stopwatch ready. When I say go, you're gonna press start on your stopwatch, read all the words out loud, and then press stop on your, start on your stopwatch to keep track of the time. So ready, set, go. All right, so most people should be done by now. Typically this exercise takes between eight and 20 seconds to read out these words. Now, I mean, this is Betsy, I did it in seven and a half seconds. So I, I guess Betsy, that's pretty Betsy, good. You're a superhuman. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think you can hop off the webinar now. This, you're, you're too good for this. <laughs> All right, so, um, yeah, so let's say between 7 and 20 seconds is, is where you should be uh, on this first test. Now, let's see how quickly you can switch gears. Reset your stopwatch. When the next slide comes up, I want you to not read at all. I want you to recognize the color that each word is written in and say that out loud. So just to repeat myself, you are not reading. You are recognizing the color that the word is written in, the color of the font, and say that out loud. Make sure you reset your stopwatch, and I'm gonna flip the slide in about five seconds. 
five, four, three, two, one. All right, so I think most people should be done by now. And what you would have noticed here is that if you struggle with cognitive flexibility, this would have been very frustrating. And you're probably ready to give up after the first or second sentence. Uh, it takes quite a while to recognize what colors I've written in and then say it out loud and then move on to the next word and then recognize and say that out loud. If you're very good at cognitive flexibility, this would have been a breeze. And typically, people experience a time somewhere between uh, one and a half to three times as long as how long it took for, to do the first one. So, um, yeah, it took me. It took me four times as long. Four times as long. Yeah, it took me four it's, times it's as long. So that's a very completely, yeah, completely time. natural, completely natural. But at least you know you didn't give up and you got through it. Some people they they struggle to even get through it, and that's because it's really hard for them to change that channel. Similar to what Dave was saying, it's hard for them to react once the circumstances change. So I just showed you a very quick little experiment here, but in the same way, when you're playing soccer or volleyball or hockey or basketball, the circumstances can change at any given time. And you have to be very quick to recognize and react and adapt to those situations if you want to be very successful in sport. Moving on to situational awareness. Dave, take it away. Yeah, so situational awareness um, pretty much sounds like the way it's written out here. Uh, we want to be responsible with the puck, responsible with the ball, forward thinking, kind of knowing uh, your surroundings, knowing where you are, knowing where your opponents are, and obviously tracking the ball, puck, or any other object uh, to score points. So it's always, it's always helpful to have uh, a second sense of calculation uh, especially at the end of a game or the end of a quarter, end of a period, you want to maintain that puck possession or that ball possession. Um, another example would be limiting turnovers. You don't throw the puck up the middle of the ice without looking. Um, another example that we see time and time again is too many men on the ice or too many men on the field. Uh, that would be a, a penalty that we, we'd like to avoid at all costs. Uh, so Abedov has a, an example here, well, of – I'm going to keep, keep going with some of these examples. So uh, in hockey, you don't want to turn over the puck. In baseball and football, as I mentioned, um, there's a new rule this year. So think about when you're training in football as a little kid, you're going up through high school, through college. Sometimes you get to the pros. And the way you tackle really hasn't changed in 20 or 30 years. Now there's a new rule that we have to be cognizant of is not – landing on the quarterback with all your weight so now we have to rethink the way we tackle and the way we approach tackling a quarterback so we don't land with our full weight on the quarterback we have to roll off so essentially you're changing that that mindset of something that is innate before now you have to kind of re rewire that process uh, another example for baseball is knowing how many how many base runners there are on each base knowing how many outs there are, uh, and again, situational awareness, knowing what you're going to do with the ball before it gets to you. That way it's an automatic process, an automatic decision. And Abhinav's got an example of uh, some other situational awareness in basketball. Yeah, ju just like the example Dave just gave, knowing the score, knowing the game clock, knowing the shot clock, and knowing what you will do with the ball and how quickly you need to do that if you do get it. That this is a situation that appears in every sport very, very often. But we have one of my favorite examples here. So I'm just going to paint the scene for you a little bit. This is the finals a uh, couple of years ago, Spurs versus Miami. Spurs are leading 3-2 in the series, uh, about to clinch. They're 10 seconds away from winning the championship over the heavily favored Miami Heat. Um, 10 seconds left. The championship trip... The championship trophy has already been carted out to center court. Not, it's not on the court just yet, but they're 
getting ready to do the trophy presentation and Spurs are just a couple of seconds away from winning it. And then this happens. So Miami Heat have the ball with 10 seconds remaining in the game down by three. The commentator just said something very interesting there. Almost like a wide receiver in football. Ray Allen was able to get both of his feet in bounds. Uh, let me see if I can get to right to the point. So LeBron James misses the three. The situational awareness of Chris Bosh and all the other Miami Heat players to crash the, the glass and try to get the rebound. Once Bosh secures a rebound, Ray Allen is running back to the three-point line as quickly as he can. Take a look at it again. He's running back to the three-point line as quickly as he can. He has to get both feet behind the black line, but in front of the other line. So just on his tippy toes, put the ball up very quickly in order to be able to get the shot off over two defenders. Yeah, Unbelievable. Totally cognizance. Unbelievable. So just knowing the entire situation, they have to get the rebound if they miss. They have to quickly pass the ball out for a three if they miss. They have to quickly put that shot up before the time expires. They were able to do all of that and go on to win the game and the series and really steal it from the Spurs. So Dave already gave us some examples here. Let's take one more look uh, at situational awareness. And this is a recent example from just this past NBA Finals. Many of you might be familiar with, uh, with this example here. Tie game, five seconds left. Rebound goes to the Cavs. J.R. Smith brings it back out. Throws it to Hill. Hill shot blocked. Every time I see this, it makes me want to bang my head against a wall. Um, Cleveland had a chance to win the game with a made free throw. J.R. Smith was tracking everything, like we talked about earlier. Athletes are tracking hundreds of objects. He must have been tracking the out-of-bounds lines, the, uh, the timeouts, all sorts of things, but he forgot to track the score. So after George Hill missed that free throw, he thought they could dribble out the clock and win the game. And as you can see, the, the, the score was tied. The game ended up going to overtime, and they ended up losing and eventually getting swept in that series. Uh, just a really boneheaded play when we think about it coming from an athlete. But if any, of our, if any of us were to do that, we'd say, oh, we're humans, right? We make mistakes. There's no way I can track 100 objects at any given time. But it really just goes to show that, you know, when you're a professional, when you're a competitive athlete, these are the types of things that will separate the average from the good and the good from the elite. Being able to have complete situational awareness, sustained attention, working memory, just to know the entire situation as we were talking about. And that brings us to my final thoughts here. Um, throughout all these uh, examples that we provided, I hope it's become evident to you that there are several, several layers of cognitive skills that are tied to performance in sport. Uh, as illustrated earlier, each and every single task it seems like it may seem like one simple thing you're doing, like remembering the snap count or trying to make that pass, but they are all dependent on a variety of underlying skills and visual cognitive infrastructure. And when it's time to perform, we use all of these skills in an integrated way. We don't just use selective attention and just use working memory. We're using divided attention, selective attention, flexible attention, all the different types of memory, 41 skills that Dave was talking about. So because when we perform, we're using all of them in an integrated way, it only makes sense that we train in that same way. Absolutely. So that the, the overriding theme here is that all these cognitive skills work together and it only makes perfect sense to train in the same way and prepare the same way as we play. 
So that's um, great information. And it's, it strikes me that um, what you've also underscored is that um, people can, you know, not everybody's born with all of these skills developed to the degree and that in fact, most of us aren't, but that um, training is a really important aspect and that these skills can actually be trained um, to pretty amazing levels actually, if you look at what some of those examples were that you shared with these elite athletes. Yep, absolutely. Okay, so um, fascinating information, a lot of new information for me since I am not an elite athlete by any stretch of anybody's imagination. Um, so I wanna make sure that everybody has a chance to ask any questions uh, that might have occurred to them along the way. You've had a couple already, but I would encourage everybody to um, just type into the chat window any thoughts or questions that you might have. Um, one of the questions that, um, came up actually from um, a number of the people when they were registering for this is the connection or the correlation between spatial skills. And I think you've addressed this. Maybe you could just come in a little bit further. Um, spatial skills and um, uh, sports performance and, and the, you know, how important that those spatial skills are in um, various kinds of sports. Yeah, so for the for the example of um, of hockey and basketball and soccer, when there's so many different movements, um, not just your opponents but your own teammates, you're constantly tracking those little uh, pro trajectories of both the ball, the puck, and those players. And if you're playing against a goalie, you're also tracking that simultaneously. So there's those th four levels uh, of visual processing, visual span, figure ground. So all those crucial visual skills um, that are the first steps of our senses, we have to make sure that that step um, is solidified before we're able to process and to make any decisions and to react. Uh, so it's, you can't get to step three without having a strong foundation of those visual and auditory skills, step one. Great. Um, it also struck me that as you were talking about some of those skills and giving some of those examples, um, you made the connection for us between uh, these sports examples and everyday life. Um, but it, it does strike me that, of course, all of these skills are important in academics, in um, our dealings with interrelationships with other people and things like that, that and so I was wondering, Abhinav, is what your thoughts are about the degree to which training these skills in a sports context might also have benefits in um, the academic setting? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think, well, not even I think, the research is out there, which shows that brainware programming and the box out visual cognitive training that, that's provided can help individuals even in an academic setting, whether it's being able to read what's on the chalkboard, what the teacher's writing, whether it's being able to participate in group projects and read body language or read visual cues and know what's happening around us on a day-to-day, -day. whether it comes to skills like negotiating or discussion, we're always going through these stages of performance and sensing, processing, deciding. Really anywhere you use those skills, this stuff matters. So it's not just about sport, but sport is something people innately understand. And that's why we made it the feature of today's webinar. Yeah, great. Um, another question we have is somebody who would like to know more about the training um, and what that would look like for a season. I, I don't know what level of athlete this person is talking about, but perhaps you could talk about um, maybe high school, college, um, or just professional, what differences there might be at those different levels? Sure. Um, so training in regards to cognitive training through, through brainware or? Well, he says, can you tell us more about the training and what it would look like for a season? So I think because he uses the word season, he's looking at um, if you were to apply these principles and the training um, for, you know, maybe a basketball team for their season or, what that might look like, what would that involve and the kind of time? For sure. Maybe that kind of For thing. sure. So, so both Brainware and Boxout are completely aligned on always uh, 
getting a baseline measure, testing before we train. Because you could train and train and train forever, but if you don't know where you stand today, if you don't know your areas of strength and opportunity, the training is relatively meaningless. So the way, the way it starts is first we administer a baseline assessment. Uh, baseline assessment of your visual sensory skills, of your cognitive skills, of your decision-making processing, and even in sports, you wanna look at where you stand today physically and how you're able to react. After that, we get into the training. So visual, cognitive, all the different types of training that we talked about can be administered completely online through our state-of-the-art programs, such as the Brainware uh, cognitive training, such as Synaptec visual sensory training, NeuroTracker, we showed an example of there. These are all companies and partners of ours, and we provide training in a very bite-sized, do-it-from-home, do it convenient type of way, where every single athlete has no barriers anymore. There's no more excuses. I can't access it. I can't afford it. I can't, uh, I can't go somewhere. Well, it's, as long as you have internet, you can do this training every single day to work on improving your visual, cognitive, and decision-making abilities. Yeah, and it's just like any other training. The, the more training, the more time, the more reps that you do, uh, the more you're going to have that automaticity. And when you get to that game scenario, uh, you're, you're clicking on, on all gears. Yeah, right. working on our eyes and our brain are muscles, just like everything else, right? So if you go to the gym one day and work on your arms, you're not going to have bulging biceps. But if you work on them repetitively, consistently, you can expect results. And it's the same way with your eyes and your brain as well. Great, and um, we're, we're over our time, but we've got one other question I think is really um, uh, insightful. Uh, I'd love to hear your response to it. So, and this is from a friend of mine named Christy, um, who um, I've known for a long time. And she's asking, is there a correlation between cognitive flexibility and emotional resilience in athletes? I would, I would say they're hand, they go hand in hand. Uh, Abhinav, what would you, how would you respond? Absolutely. I think cognitive flexibility is a requirement for emotional resiliency because if you're a single track mind and you're not able to switch gears and adapt to your circumstances, your resiliency will only take you so far. But if you're able to quickly read and react and, you know, have that cognitive flexibility to understand that situations change, it will allow you to be more emotionally resilient. However, just training your cognitive flexibility will not improve your emotional resiliency. I would say it's a requirement for it. But yeah. there are ways to work on emotional resiliency and other intangible traits like that one uh, through some of our programming as well. Yeah, and I would just add there's, there can be a, a secondary layer to that of inhibitory control, kind of having that self-modulary uh, ability, kind of um, keeping the, the emotional away from the logic, you know, those things are separate. So you want to think logically, uh, not think emotionally. So that inhibitory realm, uh, I think also has a role in that cognitive flexibility and regulating, um, self-modulating those emotions. Right. And I, Abhinav, when you were talking about, um, the example you gave, the way you described it matches up very well with the whole concept of growth mindset which is that when you when something doesn't work you need to adjust and learn uh, and try things different ways and that's what cognitive flexibility allows you to do so i would say and of course growth mindset sets you up for resilience because you know that when you encounter a circumstance that you're not necessarily familiar with or prepared for you still are going to be able to learn and to um, be effective in that situation and I think there was one more question, Betsy. Someone asked about, is there an app? Yeah. So, so yes, there, there is Brainware Safari. That's the cognitive training um, program that we offer uh, with Box Out. And it is internet. It's delivered on a computer with a mouse and a keyboard. And we're shooting for a frequency of three to five times a week over 12 to 14 weeks of sustained use. And those sessions usually last um, no more than an hour. Right. So I'm sure you'll be able to um, follow up with, um, this is, uh, we, we can tell what his, we can tell it's Y Park. Um, so we can follow up with Mr. Park or Ms. Park, depending on who that might be, and provide some additional information, which we'd be happy to do. And here again is um, 
uh, contact information for both Abhinav and Dave. So feel free to reach out to them. And of course, to me, I um, always love to hear from people who are participating in our webinars as well. So um, we're definitely have filled up our time extremely well today. A lot of great information, a lot of great insights into things that seem like they might be simple um, and how complex they can become and how um, exciting they can become when we know we can train these skills and become better at it, whether it's in the context of athletics or anything else. So Abhinav and Dave, I wanna thank you so much for um, all the hard work you did to prepare for this and all of the great insights and examples you used. I think um, that's something that really speaks to people when you can see not just, okay, these are, here's a list of skills, but really see how they're being applied. So I think that was so, so valuable. Well, Great. Thank you so Thanks, much. Betsy. Yeah, thank you. It was our absolute pleasure to be here and uh, share this information. And at the end of the day, we're just interested in helping everyone become a high performer. Right. If anyone has any further questions or wants to dive a little deeper, um, feel free to reach Ab either Abhinav or myself or um, you know, our emails or contacts are there. Great. And we hope to see you at another neuroscience and education webinar sometime soon. Actually, we're going to, the next one is going to be um, really another fascinating one where we have a guest presenter. It will be um, a case study of a school turnaround uh, that's going to be pretty remarkable. So um, stay tuned for your invitation to that one, and we'll hope to see you there. Everybody have a great rest of your week. Bye-bye.